mornings like today, I just did not want to get out of bed. And I think like, oh, but I can go have coffee. And it's like, that thought never gets old. This is a story about coffee. And every story about coffee has the same chapters or has the same acts, but the details are totally different. When you talk about the idea of specialty coffee versus commodity coffee, I mean, they're, they're two entirely different things, and when you look at who actually understands it, it's remarkably few. The specialty market is your higher end coffee, so to speak. And the commodity is typically sold to your big brands. Most coffee is traded on this blanket price, irrespective of the quality that it carries with it, and almost regardless of where it comes from. Then you have this other world. The quality that is produced in specialty and the fact that every hand that comes into play there dramatically affects what you taste in the cup. I don't think it registers in, in a lot of people's mind. They don't realize that it's such a wide gap. The commercial coffee market has been stagnant since the 60s. This is coffee? But specialty has been growing at about 10% a year. A lot of it's just putting it in people's hands, like, just try this. People experience something and find out, well, why does this taste so different? You know, what is it about it that isn't what I would assume coffee to be, you know? The ideal of specialty coffee is transparency. And that's, that's both flavor and that's also production, you know, and, and, and the facts of the coffee, knowing where it comes from. If you look at coffee historically, Ethiopians have been drinking coffee since 500 or 600. And hundreds of years ago, people took coffee from Eastern Ethiopia to Yemen. And then coffee went from there to Indonesia. And it went from there to a greenhouse in Europe. And one plant was taken from there to Martinique. That one plant became the forefather of all the coffee that was grown in Latin America for a long time. All that time, coffee's been special and treasured and unique and precious. And it was only relatively recently, historically, that it became ubiquitous, you know, like the 20th century. Honey, this coffee is the greatest. That it became commonplace in everybody's house, easy to get to, you know, you just go down to the corner, every restaurant has it kind of thing. That's a historical anomaly. How does something that's so exotic all of a sudden become kind of a mainstay of our culture? Like we're a coffee drinking culture and that clearly is embedded, it's there. There'd been in the 90s this sort of boom mentality like Starbucks is growing, everybody's growing, drinks and syrups and everything. It was this fiesta of coffee. In 2000, there was a big problem. The bottom fell out of the coffee market. Scuff 
mouthfuls erupted in Colombia on Monday after scores of angry farmers stopped work to demand an increase in government subsidies as compensation for falling coffee prices and meagre harvests. Coffee went from being at a normal level of, say, $1.25 a pound for green to 60, 50 cents a pound. And that was way below the cost of production for coffee farmers. Well, suddenly, we were looking at actual famine in the coffee world. Commodities are by nature interchangeable. That's what commodities are. When you commodify something, you say, okay, I'm gonna make it so that I'll never run out of this thing and I will be able to have a bunch of perfect copies of the same thing. Commodification was important for the food industry. I mean, they invented it at a time where they were trying to stabilize food supplies. But in coffee, that means extinguishing its specialness to have it conform to coffeeness. And that standard is pretty low. Higher quality coffee means higher prices, which sounds like something that you would take for granted, but that's a revolutionary idea, especially in the countries where coffee has grown. I think truly good coffees are harder to get, you know? Today, we're starting to see cafes presenting coffees in their single farm, single origin, and they're not fair trade anymore, only they're, they are now direct trade. This has now brought coffee farmers who are really caring, who are real craftsmen, it's allowing them for the first time to be independent of the commodity market and the swings that take place where for years in a row they could be paid under the cost of production. Aqualux! and look at the beginnings of some of the new coffee movements was that there's got to be something better. There's got to be something more unique and how do we get closer to it? The DT, the direct trade stuff, the incentives are based on performance. And if, if we're able to assist and help, we can't do it from here. There were certain things that could not have gotten accomplished in terms of knowing certain areas and when they're cultivating, when they're harvesting, why they're processing those particular coffees, and that doesn't happen without the exchange. Um, since 2005, uh, we've been very involved in, in this particular area in the southern uh, uh, district of Huye. Um, we're very committed to, to continue to buy and source from this area because of the, um, the, the, the culture and, and the quality of the coffee and really the, the partnership that we've been able to establish. Um, without all of 
the, the layers uh, of people that are involved uh, to, to bring um, coffee to our market, it wouldn't work. So it's not just a business transaction, but it's a partnership and it's a relationship. We're really trying to make sure that we reinforce um, not just the, the buying of the coffee, but the, the things that help build community. You know, that, that's a big part of it. Even the more expensive $7 a cup coffee that people see in their, their boutique cafe is underpriced with the amount of hours and labor and, and everything that goes into it. <laughs> they say on average one coffee tree produces about a pound of coffee a year. Most of the coffee grown outside of large farms in Brazil is hand-picked. You start doing the math on how many pounds of coffee are sold just in your corner cafe. So that's somebody that's reaching up and pulling every, every little cherry down. So we're talking a lot of labor, a lot of labor. And that's just the picking part. Processing, if you're getting ripe fruit and ripe coffee, that's the landscape. So now you've picked the beautiful landscape. But the processing is like the window through which you see the landscape. If the processing isn't perfect, your window's dirty. All of these things involve tremendous focus on the part of the people doing it. It becomes critical to, to find coffees that are done with that kind of artisan attention to detail and commitment.
amateka ikawa bavuga ko yazanye mu Rwanda n'abadaji kugira cy'abadaji mu myaka ishira igihumbi 1895 mbere mbere ya ya genocide ikawa yakorwaga yahingwaga nabahinzi igatungwa nabahinzi mu rugo aho genocide irangiriye leta yashakishije uburyo yafasha abahinzi kugira ngo bagire bazamure bagire inyungu mu byo bakora akabaro bifite ni nukugira ngo tugire dukomeze ubwiza bwika hanyuma yuvanye mu bintu byiza mu murima uruganda rugufasha kubibunga bo Once we take someone to origin, everybody's always blown away because they just see the things that nobody else gets to see that make up that cup. I think the sense that it's a living thing, you know, it's something that isn't just like a widget in a box. All the while, there's tons of challenges that could get in the way of, of the quality. You know, in Rwanda, like we saw that, there isn't some fancy meter to come in and make sure that the coffees are ready to come out of the fermentation tanks. It's done by hand, literally, or, you know, done by feet, like we talked about, where people are trying to move that mucilage, that honey goo substance off of the parchment. There's still tons of hands that touch that coffee before it gets exported, and we probably would say at least nine different sets of, you know, processes or people involved like make that happen. All of the drying, making sure that coffees are evenly turned and so that they're consistent. You know, those are just a couple examples of like just having to hand care for coffee. Modale, 
It's cosmic in scale, how coffee can come that far and become, bizarrely, a ordinary thing on everybody's breakfast table. Somehow it ends, when it's roasted, that people have this kind of like static sense of what it is, that it's not alive anymore, that it's kind of just something that's just ground and put into a brewer and it's brown solution that wakes you up. After people started working with farmers, trying to celebrate individual coffees and individual producers of coffee, then you wanted to accentuate the differences, the nuances in the coffee. What made it special? That led to lighter roasting. Those super unique coffees tend to be from the minute you look at the samples and start to examine them, you know that like this looks good. And even when we sample roast, a lot of insights gain. So when Craig is roasting, he's seeing things that are developing in the coffee. And before he even cups it, it's like kind of a window. The moment that it's harvested, all the quality is there. And nobody who comes next in the chain is gonna add quality to the coffee. Everybody's gonna take away a little bit. And I think that the goal should be to take away as little as possible and really try to reveal what is locked into that coffee at the moment of harvest. The message starts to be, for single origin, you wanna do a light roast. And the awareness that dark roast covers things. It's like a heavy sauce. There's that sense of that there's something still undiscovered in a way, like maybe from more of a flavor point of view. It's kind of tough um, with um, odor uh, because you have that wood smoke that's happening outside. That's why you know you want kind of controlled space, but just maybe those first kind of moments of having a coffee experience and thinking, you know, if they'd just done something maybe a little bit differently processing or harvesting or fermentation, that there may be some other layer, something that has yet to be experienced, you know? And then we might backtrack and find out, oh, well, you know, there were some different varieties in that particular outturn. 
I thought there was potato. Yeah, it's it's really strong. I think it's best just to leave off. Yeah. And and then we'll give that flavor feedback, and then that kind of sounds off for people that are at you know on the producer side saying, oh, that's interesting. You caught that. Once we grind, you really have about 30 minutes maximum, really, uh, before you start losing some of the aromatics. I think, you know, those super kind of unique coffees tend to be, um, from the minute you look at the samples and start to examine them, you know that, like, this looks unique or special. But and now all I've got to do is try to bring that back. I can't tell you how many times over the years you would get coffee and just be so excited about it at origin, and by the time it landed, it's not even a remnant of what you thought it was when you tasted it there. That's changing. So it's kind of like that pursuit that there's something out there that could be even more extraordinary. Definitely, they're right in the, the zone right now, so. When you cut hundreds and thousands of samples in a year, you start to see where the average is just kind of lacking any depth, you know, and it's coffee coffee. It seems a little bit softer in the mouthfeel than, than maybe the, the others, but, um, but nice. Yeah, very smooth. I mean, I think you probably could draw the same analogy with good wines that are, that are decent and they're sweet and they're tart, but they don't have any follow through. And I think our, our best coffees tend to always have that. There's something at the tail end of that flavor spectrum that just all of a sudden kind of is like, wow, that really is there. I totally get bergamot. I totally get, you know, lemon peel. Cupping is sort of the international standard for how we score coffee. And it's the same procedure whether you're in Brazil or Kenya, Ethiopia, Canada, wherever you are. Coffee is like the colors of the rainbow. There are a lot of flavors to them, and they are intrinsic to those particular coffees, to where they were grown, the variety, and all the rest. So suddenly, the world of coffee really expands it's no longer a cup of joe. It's now an adventure in search of the ultimate cup. The more you, you taste and the more you start to taste better qualities and, and, and open new doors, you really find that how you make the coffee, how you brew it, starts to change as well. Yeah. What would you like, my man? Uh, you got uh, Americano to go with um, all glasses. Right? Today, I'm much more into drip with a paper filter. I like a very clear cup. So I don't want any sediment plugging the pores in my mouth and reducing my sensitivity to the flavor notes. When you have a cup of coffee, you're starting hot, and that's really just the aromatics. A great light roasted coffee is very mild at that point, almost watery in many cases. Let it cool. Take time. As the coffee starts to cool, your taste buds start to taste more and more. You start to be able to smell the flavors more. And as that temperature goes down from the brewing temperature, which is like 200 plus, down to 185, still piping hot, now down to 135, now you start to really taste a lot more going on in the coffee. If the coffee's been processed really right, and if it's ripe coffee, you start to realize there are these transparent layers. And you pick up on one layer, then you pick up on another, then you pick up on another, 
and they start to add to each other a little bit symphonically. Well, the siphon was invented in the 1860s, I think, by a Scottish marine engineer. Like a lot of things, it got invented somewhere else, but perfected in Japan. I really wanted to have a siphon bar. And then I was scouting around locations. When I walked into the space, it was so beautiful, like the elegance and the verticality. It's like, oh, this is the perfect place to have a siphon bar. Mm. I think that's what it does embody, is this perfect and unlikely combination of the taste. This is a paddle I carved myself. The theater of it. I don't want to boss it around. I just want to nudge it a little bit. The gear is super cool. The light it produces, so you get all of those things. Just symbolically, you know, think about coffee, like taking five seconds and going out of a tap. There it is. You know, versus coffee being a process that you get to watch and participate in, and then somebody hands it to you, and it tends to be more beautiful, and, and that's a huge symbolic change. The great thing about improving your coffee brewing is that it's not subtle. Once you get something that's really good and vibrant and well made, it's hard to go back. Even though we see in the U.S. a lot of popularity with brewed, filter, uh, pour-over, drip coffee, espresso is still, uh, still captivating a new audience. Espresso is not a drink. It's a kind of drug. That's why my espresso is less than one ounce. Sometimes it's a half ounce. Doesn't matter if it's bigger or small. Most important is invited to the other world. Same as a drug. My passion is espresso, and I try to find this espresso. Still, the unknown, lot of the secret, and the same as universe. We are totally different as a coffee shop in Japan, and also should be in the world more individual. Katsu is like amazingly committed. I've never seen anyone. His aesthetic in his shop is New York, right? You're trying to evoke the New York coffee experience. But man, he approaches it in such a disciplined and perfectionist way. I've never seen anything like it. Dude won't open his shop until he feels like the coffee's right in the morning, you know? And that's really appealing. Bear Pond is a philosophy. Don't you think of other people's opinion. Don't think 
other people's、uh, movement. There's all this focus on drip coffee, and then there's focus on espresso, and really they're the same thing. This one just has pressure added. It's totally different. Definitely, water is different, hard and soft, and also the moisture and the temperature are different. I'm excited. People exploring what the real effect of that is, and kind of breaking down this the barrier of what espresso is versus what drip coffee is, and demystifying espresso. Flavor depends on the behind culture. Service behind is a bit of society. Everything individual totally different. Cannot say good or not. Just I wanna say. I'm just on the focus, sexy. Coffee people have to be sexy. Barista competitions are the face that specialty coffee has to offer as to the high end of what we're doing, and sort of a unified front. It's a chance for us to say to the media, "Hey, look at this! Look at what we pay attention to. What's important to us? How legitimate we are." Part Olympics, part dog show, part personal crisis. Now this is espresso and carbonated strawberries, which I've supercharged with CO2 in a whipper. Now, as they sit in the espresso, these strawberries release tiny CO2 bubbles. Imagine soda going flat, filling the espresso with strawberry aromatics. Brews competitions are a sport. You go out, you have a good day, you win. You go out, you have a bad day, you lose. When you compete, you're going up against people that this is their focus in life. Our champion's already ready to give it another try for 2013, so I'm not going to waste any time. Katie Carjulo from Counterculture Coffee, Brooklyn, New York. Thanks, Carrie. A great cup of coffee for coffee people is really complex, but I want to be able to explain it to people so that they can start to dig their heels in a little bit and understand what makes coffee what it is. I want to just make tasty things for people, and I want them to be happy, and I want them to enjoy it. But I want to be able to communicate a little bit on a deeper level, sort of what makes the coffee that I'm making so different and so much more special than any other coffee that they drink. Coffee gets made three times. It's first made at the farm when cherries are harvested, and then they're processed and dried to become beans. It is next made at the roastery. Where beans go from green to brown, and roasters use their machines to balance out the flavors in the coffee with flavors that are created by the roast. And the last time it gets made is when it's made into a beverage. And this kind of gets all the credit because this is what people see. They see it in their own homes. They see it in cafes. And on special days, they see it on barista competition stages. So any day that you drink a coffee, these are the three acts of its story. So as a customer, your experience of a beverage is not just limited to the flavor, and that's really what I like about cappuccinos is that they're very pretty, and they're served with a visual representation of the skill of the people that make them, in the form of a little heart or a delicate flower, which is in and of itself a visual representation of all things romantic, and that's sort of how I feel about cappuccinos, and it's what I like about being a barista, is that we are the people that get to romance people into the world of specialty coffee. Your experience today. Thank you so much for being here. Time. Time. Come on back, champ. Ladies and gentlemen, Katie Carjulo, Counterculture Coffee, Brooklyn, New York. Sound guy, we're ready.
You are. Go ahead and press the start button, brother, and take that 15 minutes on. Devin Chapman. Of all the people who make up the chain of the industry, who do you value the most? Had the opportunity to ask this question to one of our producers named David Mancia while visiting his farm this past October. His answer not only surprised me, but has brought fresh inspiration to the way that we run our retail program at Kova. This is what he said. He said the consumer, the ones that you sell my coffee to, because they're the ones who put food on my table. They are the ones who provide for my family the namesake of my farm. Me llamo David Manzi Ortiz. Yo cosecho café hace 14 años. Tengo 10 hijos con la esposa. Todos trabajamos unidos, juntos. Y ellos se arreglan el café a buena hora. Ellos lo expulpan, ellos lo jalan. Ellos hacen todo. Comencé el año 81. Desde ese tiempo para acá he estado cultivando. Tengo muchos planes, de, por ejemplo, a mejorar mi vivienda, a mejorar el estudio a mis, a mis hijos y muchas cosas que tenemos que mencionar. ¿va? El café tiene buena fama, aparte de eso que la elaboración que le dan muy bueno, magnífico. Anteriormente nosotros no sabíamos, sembrábamos café, lo cortábamos, lo, lo preparábamos, pero no sabíamos qué tipo de, de producto teníamos. Hasta hoy que, que ha llegado. Bueno, este, pues muy buenos días a todos. Este, pues hoy este, lo, lo reunimos aquí para hacer una presentación con, con sus compradores, algunos de ustedes, con Kevin, que, que es el barista. Él va a estar preparando los cafés que ustedes producen. So we like to make espresso for you all to try as just the coffee, but also with steamed milk for cappuccino. In the cafes, this is the majority of the way that people are drinking the coffee. Today we have espresso from La Piñona and Las Flores and Las Manas. Entonces hoy van a tener, van a probar espresso de La Piñona, que es de Don Sebastián, de Las Flores, que es el café de César, y de Las Manas, que es el café de Alex. Ahora vamos a seguir con el espresso del, de Las Manas, de la finca de Alex.
pues ahora pues tenemos más mejores beneficios con los precios que tenemos actuales. Porque él a mí me dijo que me lo iba a comprar por toda la vida. ¿Ya? <risa> dice, dice Kevin o sea, que a él le gusta el capuchino, el café suyo así, con dos del precio. Queda más fuerte. Queda más fuerte. Ah, okay. Ahí está. Más fuerte que este. Sí. Ah. <risa> yeah. That's good. Bueno, sabemos que sale bueno. <laughs> you want to taste it with two shots? Talk about that whole elevation of quality. We are very confident that the best coffees in the world are processed as a fully washed coffee. You know, areas where there is a lack of water, it, it's a very difficult thing to kind of, obviously you need to make a living, you need to be able to produce coffee, but you know, we are looking for that one source that helps kind of drive it all the way through to the finished product, which is water. Cyo gusha cyo kuzana amazi ni ukubera ko umwaka ushize napfushije kali napfushije kalite kubera amazi kuri kibazo cy'amazi Gitekereza nza kukigeza kuri RTC Bambaza igisubizo cyacyo niba hari cyo mfite Bambwira ko ari isoko ihari Bambwira ko bagiye kuvugana na na Stamp Town cyo cyo babankorera David explained it to me later people are walking up to 2 kilometers to another area where there is a water receiving station and if I just brought it down and irrigated it, then I would be able to accomplish what I need as a company and as a business, but I also could help the community. I don't know It's like one of those win-win things where it's like we're going to be able to do a lot more with just putting this infrastructure in place that really wasn't there. If we could actually get even better coffee and pay a better price, then what would then be the next cycle that comes out of that?
coffee rewards practice and discipline. It makes people, you know, value it more in a non-economic way. You know, the idea of craft and perfection, doing it over and over and over and over again until it's perfect is so good for coffee. I think it's natural to turn to the Japanese kisaten or the coffee master in our, our search for coffee. You go in to sit down and order, usually say like uh, blendo and demitas. Then there's this wall of cups behind the barista and he'll turn and look. It's like, hmm, which cup? There are all these mismatched cups, right? Which cup is the right cup for this person? some sort of magic how they take coffees that may be a little more modest some of them uh, but they, they transform them more they through effort and dedication that the transformational moment is rendered more explicit in a, a Tokyo coffee bar a, a, a great one can be just like this glorious five minutes like it's not a commitment dinner is a commitment you know if people associate that with being something rare and beautiful and difficult they're more likely to appreciate what's in their coffee
I do think people feel connected to a story that might not be about taste or flavor, but I think that's always been the kind of the pinnacle. I could have something that's just subpar, but an amazing story about how maybe we've helped people in their communities and their villages to improve what they're doing, but it's got to all kind of come together. When you buy anything, you're making a statement. So if you want people to keep making great coffee, if you want people to, to just physically plant coffee and not sustenance food, you have to be willing to put your money into that. Next for the ripe coffee. If we want coffee to keep being great and tasting great, in a way you, you can't buy the other stuff. The group I see now have pushed the envelope much further and continue to do so. And even if one generation sort of reaches its groove, there's another set coming right behind it, pushing the envelope still further. And that's a really exciting world. I think the misconception about coffee as a ubiquitous, commodified thing that just sits in your cupboard like sugar or flour, it's widely available and inexpensive. That's not what coffee is.